1976, at late 76, early 77 is when I began. And then we just went on from there, still going. The original bass player of the Ants, Andy Warren, myself, um, there was a guy called Lester Square who joined the monochrome set with Andy Warren, and another guy called Bid who came in for a couple of days. He's the singer of uh, monochrome set. But we, uh, we used to do my early material. We used to do all the stuff, um, you know, the beat my guests and the, the physicals, and we did um, the usual things like Louie Louie and stuff like that, and we did a couple of kink songs, you know, She's Got Everything. The official debut of the Ants um, was at the ICA, the Institute of Contemporary Art, in London, in Pall Mall, which is very posh, no, Buckingham Palace is 50 yards away, and there we were, and it's very arty, you know, you, which was ironic because, you know, you go in there and there, there's many themes, that you see sort of heavy underground movies in there dealing with quite sort of heavy topics, like I saw Dynamite Chick in there and Robert gets his nipple pierced with Patti Smith, and quite heavy sexual themes, and I went in there at the time, you know, the, I was doing all that heavy leather stuff, so I chained myself up and wore a hood and all that stuff. And I came down and we, we played, I told them we were a country and western group, which I suppose is a bit of a fib. And we turned up in the lunch hour in the, um, you know, and there was, a, I remember there were about three people in there having their lunch. And we came in and did um, Beat My Guest. And I was chained up and, and after, literally after Beat My Guest, the woman came along and paid me my eight pounds and said, we'd like you to leave. So then we were asked, there was somebody playing in the ICA theatre behind, so they said, well, you can come and finish your show in, in our interval, so we did, and the actual, the show went on. We'd only, the, the guitarist had actually joined that afternoon, Mark Ryan, he just joined in the afternoon, but we played, and it was good, it was a start, but I actually do have uh, a friend of mine, a college friend of mine, who was, uh, wrote to me the very da the other day saying that he had all the photographs from that early gig and that did I want them, so I shall soon see what that looked like. My target at that stage was to just get as far away from the life that I'd had for that many years to completely go out on a limb and take my chances and to really make a record and make Adam and the Ants a household world. That was basically it and I didn't really care what ups and downs I had to go through and there were many of them. And by the time Adam and the Ants went on top of the pops in England and went on TV and sold a quarter of a million records the next day I was prepared, strangely enough, because I'd had four years of complete craziness. You know, it was beyond streets, beyond fanaticism. It, you know, because fanaticism's boring. Because a fanatic doesn't know when the war's over; still fighting battles. Mm -hmm. I just felt that there was such a an energy and a burst of excitement every time we went on stage, and to see this audience. We built an audience. We did. I did not steal one. I didn't try and pander to other styles to get one. I built one. There were five people at the first concert, then ten, then fifteen. And then when you get into selling fifteen million records like we have, you realise that it's grown, but it, it, it began. And it was a wonderful feeling because you haven't compromised yourself in any way. And I don't think we have. Well, the rock and roll alternative continues, and tonight we've got with us, through the magic of iron oxide, members of the Damned. Greetings, guys. All right. All right. <laughs> well, we have uh, Rats Gabies and Dave Vanian, and uh, a relatively new member of the band, Roman Jug. When did the band first get together? Yeah, 75. Yeah, about December 75. And I guess it was then it was almost a year before you cut your first record. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was just a bit okay. Well, the whole attitude of New Rose was so foreign to anything else that was happening at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, over here, Styx was king of the airways, and something like this comes out. What in the world possessed you to put out a record like that? Those reasons you've just given us. Okay. It's so boring and apathetic and nothing going on, and it was frustrating. I mean, so, you know, you. You, when you're sort of 16, 17, 18 and just sort of really begin to listen to music a lot, I mean, you, I wanted something of my own to listen to and I couldn't get anything to listen to that my parents didn't have in their, in their own record collection. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't want that, I wanted something that was mine. So there wasn't any, so the only way we could do it was by doing it ourselves. 
at that time, and, and even today, do you think it's important to be a good musician to make good records? No, I think the, the less you know about music, then the better you are, you're off really. It's, quality isn't necessarily clever, in, you know, you don't have to be a flashy guitarist to play a good guitar solo. In the, uh, the image of the band, I've heard many people say that you can be a, a terrific band and if you don't have something that's memorable, that the people can talk about, that you'll just get nowhere. And Dave, you seem to have become a, a focal point with your, your capes and, and such, and Captain in the early days wearing the uh, tutus. And Nurses you was, Yeah, was that uh, no, intentional was image just, maintenance? That just came again from the individuality in the band, you know. Um, why Sensible ever wore a ballet's tutu, I could not tell you. I think it was probably for se sexual deviation. I, I think so. I've, I've, I've often, I've often yeah. suspected, well, I've never found out. Yeah. I've often suspected you should get some sort of cheap thrill out of yeah, it all, yeah, but right, I'm, yeah. it's, you know, a very thin line. Yeah, yeah. You I can't tell whether he's doing it because he's, he's a lunatic. or. We <laughs> but it fits so nice. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Especially with those boots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I think really the thing with the captain is he just wants to, he doesn't care. He mm. wants to, he wants to be, you know, if he wants to dress up in a dress, great, let him. Why shouldn't he? Why shouldn't you do anything you want? Well, the, the thing about punk, for us, it was like an inspiration for us to say, well, look, we can do something. We don't need to be that proficient or we don't need to have the might of the world's biggest record company behind us to make a record. We can make a record and we can play if we want to and there's people that would want to listen to it. So the types of music that we listened to before then have obviously had an influence on us as well and the types of music that our brothers would have listened to you know, when we were about 12 and they were coming home with records. It's obviously had an effect upon us and we never set out to do records that were deliberately uh, slow or fast. It was just particular music which we liked. The ethic of punk is the thing that appealed to us, the, the fact that you could do something and you didn't need anybody else to, uh, to, to help you as much. On the first record, Killing an Arab, the sound of the band, it sounded like uh, the guitar, that dum, 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 dum. It's yeah. very, very spare. The, the, the whole thing with that was that we'd made everything so that it was minimal because we didn't like fuss in songs, you know? There's a lot of things that are put there that don't really need to be there. A lot of uh, like frills, superfluous frills, and we just tried to cut everything down, so that's why it sounds like it does. And, and also, uh, I think it was because we were you know, just starting to become familiar with what we were actually doing and how we could do things. So we didn't want to push ourselves out so far. We'd rather just sit there on the same level. We just took basic things, put them all together, and didn't add anything on, on it at all because we wanted to be able to play all the things live the same way that we did them in the studio. So that was one, that was one of the reasons why it was like that. And also the mood of the thing, uh, the mood of, of that particular song is not, it's not a, a glamorous, warm mood. It has to be harsh and, and simple and stark because that's what the song's about, about uh, a little stab of reality in, in uh, a lot of chaos, which is what the, what the whole book was about. Then there is, I bought it as an import, took it home, wanted to play tracks on the radio, and I didn't know what the tracks were. Oh, right. And you had it's been a long time since <laughs> somebody's asked me this, this, this question. I don't know, in a way it was, that, that, that idea was so that, uh, like, like with the idea of not having our pictures on, on the album cover, well, it was just there was, no, there was no titles to the track, just symbols, which was supposed to correspond with the symbols on the... Uh, on the back cover. Uh, some, something there went horrendously wrong because the pictures didn't quite turn out the way we'd envisaged because we didn't really have that <laughs> as much control then as we have now about things like that. So uh, uh, for the first first few months, people were you know, always writing to us, well, what does it mean? Where's, what's the title of this song? We had some really funny titles that people had thought <laughs> the song was supposed to be called. I think uh, Foxy Lady was Bob Delaney. That was another one. Bob Delaney. Yeah, that's what they thought it was called, mm. Bob Delaney. I mean, that's the only song that wasn't ours on it as well. I mean, it's a well-known song. But it's such a mutant version. Yeah, I mean, on purpose, because we'd, we'd, we'd played, like I was saying before, with, with uh, you know, our other influences on the music that we'd heard before we started. Some, some of it was Hendrix and things like that. And uh, we'd always admired that particular style of doing things. Uh, so then we 
changed his style around completely. I, th I think it, the idea with it was to make it interesting and stop like, the connections that people have with uh, an album cover. I mean, now I suppose you could say that we do that anyway. We, we put an album cover out which just gives an indication of what's inside, what the record's like. But at the time we didn't want people to sort of see a picture of three, three boys on the front and think, oh, I know what this record's like from the way they look, from the way they dress. We wanted people to, to listen to the record and then form an opinion on that. It's tough to tell what a record sounds like when you've got a fridge, a lamp, and a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. There's been some funny things that happened with that. There's been record shops in Germany with the whole sets created in the shop with fridges and vacuum cleaners and things. It was most bizarre. But uh, in a way, that was like a, a joke because it, it was... Like, a lot of people would see something in it and they'd think, oh, that must be very significant, you know, it must be very deep and these poor boys must be pained. It was a, a jibe at people like that, and also it was. Uh, they did this. They do symbolise each member of the band in in a in a humorous way as well. I so, see. Except mine now should be a big whip. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, carry on.